Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Um, I'm gonna talk about the future of, of API integration, but in order to do that, I thought it might be useful um, to start by looking at the past. And we're gonna do this in a few steps. So number one, who saw the opening keynote, Yuri's keynote uh, first thing yesterday morning? I'm trying to look for hands here, it's hard to see. Okay, most of you, good. Because there's definitely relevance there. I think that helps us map a path towards the future for sure. Um, I'm gonna ask you to think a little bit further back. Who came to the API Days event, San Francisco 2013? I see one hand. Okay, this is both, a couple of hands. Uh, this is both good and bad. It's good because for some of you, this will be the first time you're seeing some of this content. Uh, uh, and, and in actual fact, I am stealing, plagiarizing, borrowing a little um, from one of my friends and colleagues, Mike Amundsen, who gave a, uh, a talk on uh, scale-free networks um, at the 2013 event. And, and so I'm gonna use some of that story that he told and then pivot kind of in the middle uh, to something else entirely. But uh, yeah, for those of you that have never seen it before, that's, that's, uh, that's probably a good thing. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to say is, as we look at the future, we're, we need to actually plan for the future of API integration. Um, I would argue that the approach that we're taking today, the path that we're on today, isn't necessarily the path that's going to serve us best as we look towards the future. Um, in fact, there's a, a strong argument to say that the way that we think about API integration today runs counter to the way the modern web works. And, and there's a few reasons for that. And in order to, to understand those reasons, I'm gonna take an even further step back in time. Um, oh, I'm not, I'm first gonna say, Ugh, apocalypse of scale. Uh, because one of the big problems that I see coming is that we're not planning um, for the scale that, that uh, is in front of us in the world of APIs and the world of, of API-based integration. So, looking back even further, way back to 1994, when uh, the, the web was a very new idea. And uh, this young man is, uh, is Jerry Lang. He'd started, he's at uh, Stanford in 1994, um, the HTTP uh, spec was invented in 92. We didn't have the URI specification yet. It didn't come along until 1995. Um, the, we were really at the very beginnings of, of what the web was going to be, the way that we understand the web working today. And one of the things that Jerry was working on was um, this guide to the World Wide Web. Of course, this became Yahoo. And uh, this was, in its very beginnings, a curated list, really, of, of the internet, right? It was um, a hierarchical indexed list of all of the places that you could possibly visit, the very beginnings, early days of, of the internet. Um, and of course, it was rather difficult to find stuff with this list, because even in the early days, it was growing pretty fast. Um, and, and it wasn't very difficult, uh, sorry, it was very difficult to, to keep this up to date. Obviously, it's changing progressively uh, and aggressively over time. If we take a little step forward to 1998, um, these two uh, young men uh, were also at Stanford, and they were working on this project, this paper, to describe um, perhaps a new beginning for the web um, that they called at the time Backrub. People are familiar with Backrub? One or two, five or six hands maybe? Yeah, so Backrub was really to help address some of the pain. What they said in this paper, and this is a really interesting paper to go read actually, it's a good, it's really good context to understand you know, how we got from there to here and where hopefully we're going in the next decade or the next two decades of, um, of the web and web APIs and API-based integration. And what they said during this uh, particular paper is that all of the things that we knew, all of the things that we were doing, 
just weren't true anymore. In three short years, everything that we tried to understand about managing the web just wasn't true. They needed a new approach, new technologies, um, really a new doctrine to figure out how we were going to tackle the problem that was scale. The scale apocalypse was upon us during the early days of web and search. And just to understand the scale problem, I didn't use a hockey stick graph here because we use lots of those everywhere all of the time, and I've got some of them coming up later, in fact. Uh, but the, 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 the beginnings of the web was growing so incredibly fast, right? 94, 110,000 web pages. By 97, um, we were at 2 million web pages. And at the time they were writing this document, um, they were predicting to be well above a billion web pages by the year 2020. Um, this was the sort of growth that nobody could really have predicted or planned for, except perhaps that um, Bryn and uh, Paige were predicting it. And of course, the uh, Backrub uh, project was the very beginnings of what we know as Google today. <clears throat> and these two guys, you know, understood that we had a scale problem. They realized that this growth couldn't possibly be served well if we were indexing and, and listing and curating uh, every single page that was out there. And they needed to think about a way of, of reaching this, um, uh, to becoming scale-free. Who's familiar with the term scale-free networks? I'm not a mathematician or a physicist or really um, clever in any way. Uh, and, and so I don't know a whole lot about scale-free networks either. But what I do know is um, they, the definition of a scale-free network is that degree distribution follows a power law. So de degree distribution is basically the number of connection points to a particular node. And, um, and, and so the number of connections that we have at every node uh, is not equally distributed. It follows a power law. And a power law is something that even if you've never heard of it before, you'll have seen it before because it looks like this. It is the hockey stick graph. I told you I was going to have one of those. Um, and so in this world, we often see this as um, a sort of commercial equivalent. We think of this as the long tail uh, where the things on the, uh, the, 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 the top end of the graph have most of the connections, right? We think about this in, in Amazon's context, right? Uh, where um, most, the most popular products have many purchases, but there are many more purchases for the long tail of less popular products. Uh, and this, this is exactly what this graph is showing, right? Many connections to few nodes and few connections at many nodes. And it was this that uh, our friends at Google really understood. It was this problem that they were trying to solve for and understand and plan for. <clears throat> yes, few nodes have many links. Many nodes have a few links. This is the long tail. This is what was becoming the web. And I would argue very strongly that this is exactly where we are in the world of APIs today. <clears throat> Brynn and Sergey realized that um, curation aggregation just wasn't going to work. This is why Jerry was wrong, ultimately. Um, and it was um, the, the way in which we aggregated all of these links together, that the discovery and experience and the self-service, the fact that you click things um, was, was a, the way that we allowed um, web search to eventually work and, and allowed us to connect all of these things together in a much more scalable way. <clears throat> so. Back to the sort of beginning, the warning that I said that perhaps we're on the wrong path with web APIs and API-based integration. Um, and how should we perhaps take a different direction? Well, some more context and numbers I think is important here. The first thing is that in a modern enterprise, there are more than 1,200 separate applications that a business relies upon in order to function every day. These are Everything from the sales forces and the net suites and the oracles and the SAPs of the world through to cloud storage applications like Box and Dropbox, your communication services, 
hundreds of things, more than a thousand things um, that, a, that a large organization typically, typically leans upon. Now, I'm not saying that central IT necessarily knows everything there is to know about 1,200 separate apps, but in, within the business, this is the sort of scale problem that we're talking about. And just to use more of these hockey stick graphs, right, this translates to a, uh, a much bigger problem when we think about the number of APIs that we're dealing with, right? We're way past the ability to, to, to manage our API ecosystem and the future of integration uh, with a curated hierarchical list. And many have tried, right? We know I'm not gonna call out names of companies or platforms or, or whatever, but we know of um, API aggregation uh, companies, right, that are trying to document and list every available API. That's just not a feasible thing to do. We used to show, um, you know, the programmable web graph, and it was eventually, they, they, it wasn't much point maintaining that in some ways because they can't possibly keep track of all of the APIs um, that are out there. And the same is true even within your own businesses, right? If you're saying that we should have our own internal API app store or a marketplace that lists all of the APIs we have available. Sure, that's fine if you've got 20. What if you've got 2 million? Like it just it doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. This, this level of scale um, doesn't, it can't be served well um, with a curated list. <clears throat> and cracks are forming. We're definitely starting to see the pain and challenges of this problem. Integration has become brittle, and it's become brittle because of the very thing that we've been relying upon, right, these APIs. Because now very small changes can become very big problems. Uh, I happen to be, fr uh, I'm not from Colorado, but I live in Colorado, just in Denver. And outside Denver, there's a, a highway called US 36 that is falling apart right now. And it started as a very small crack about a week ago. And it has almost entirely uh, fallen apart over the past week. And I feel like these same little cracks are starting to appear in our enterprise architecture and our API integration strategies, and we're, if we ignore them for too long, we're gonna get into trouble real fast. <clears throat> like I said, one small thing can have a very large knock-on effect. If somebody's API changes, it can break hundreds or potentially thousands of integrations. And my argument here is not that we shouldn't use our APIs, but rather we need to think about what we're actually doing with them. There's a piece of fundamental value inside API-based integrations that we've perhaps forgotten about or, or choose to not consider or, or something else. It's, it, we're not um, you know, maliciously ignoring a problem, I don't think. But there is a problem. So how does this power law thing apply? I would contend that uh, if we look at the problem we're trying to solve, resiliency here exists in hubs. And this is where Mike and I's uh, version of this kind of diverge a little bit, because he was saying, uh, be a node, not a hub, back then. I'm saying that we should think about um, how the data we care most about can be brought together in a cohesive way. How we can reach the long tail of applications, integrate everything that we care about, and do it in a hub-like fashion in order to scale up and reach all of the nodes. And this is why I also said that Yuri's presentation um, yesterday morning was important because he talked about this too in a slightly different context, but he talked about it in the sense that there is a bunch of important data inside your business that you should care about and focus on and manage, and it are, it's those things that we seem to lose track of uh, in the world of API-based integration. And it's those pieces of data that I'd, I would challenge us all to think a little bit more critically about. API integration is about the data. It's the data inside your apps, right? It's not necessarily the apps themselves. It's certainly not the API interfaces. Uh, it's the data that's important to you that you're trying to move around but from one location to another, from one application to another. Um, enriching data in context with a bunch of applications coming together. Um, and if we can start to build up a, an understanding of the data inside our apps that's being moved around with these APIs, then we can build a much more resilient uh, API integration strategy that will serve even the smallest nodes. So going back again to that notion that there's 1,200 plus applications 
if I'm doing this point-to-point -point thing with, with APIs, I can typically only fully understand perhaps five or six apps, and that was fine a few years ago, right? You bought half of your stuff from Oracle and half of your stuff from SAP, and that was absolutely fine. That's just not the world we live in today. There is now hundreds, there are now hundreds of uh, systems of record out there, and we have to try and manage all of them in a more cohesive way. <clears throat> If we focus only on these large nodes, only on the things that, you know, uh, the, the, the world of the past, where it was five or six things, we can't possibly build a resilient and scalable um, integration strategy. So what I'm talking about is a, an API data hub, an understanding of things that are common. These could be products and orders and invoices and customers and contacts and employees and, and these sorts of things that are important to you. I'm not saying we should curate them. I'm saying we should try to understand the, uh, the pieces of data that are core and common across your application ecosystem, bringing together these layers of data uh, rather than trying to curate um, all of your apps together. <clears throat> And I think this is well illustrated if we kind of look at how point-to-point -point integration works. It quickly spiderwebs into, uh, into this mess of integration that you can't, you can't really manage this, right? You can't, I have no understanding in a spiderweb model um, of how uh, something, uh, how NetSuite and Salesforce and Jira and Oracle are talking to each other. I can't possibly expect it to carry all that information around in my head. Even the way we talk about the problem, if we talk about it in terms of connecting apps together, we're forgetting about this important thing in the middle. What is it? What are we trying to do with these integrations? What's, uh, wh where's the actual value lie? Um, we should use different words. We shouldn't talk about connecting apps. We should talk about um, the, the things inside these apps. It's much more important. And there are definitely evolutions in the world of APIs um, that will help us go there. We've been uh, talking about GraphQL quite a lot um, during this conference, and I think there's a lot of benefits to be had um, seeing how GraphQL can help us interact with data, be a much more searchable and scalable way, perhaps, for um, the future of, of API and data integration. But that's not, that's not a nirvana state today, for sure. And we've got a lot, of, there's a lot of work that we can do right now. This, this picture is simpler if we think about bringing together all of these applications, what's common and core across the board, right? It might be something as simple as a customer in the middle of this picture, right? That's, what's a that's what actually matters here. I can understand that. I don't need to understand that there's some complexity and difference of how NetSuite thinks of a customer or um, Oracle thinks about a customer. I just want to know how I need to worry about that. How does my business um, deal with, manage, interact with the concept of a customer. That's how we can build an integration strategy that, uh, that scales up going forward. <clears throat> and just uh, for the purposes of having an eye chart, um, I think this, uh, you know, if we think about our application uh, ecosystem in, this, in the terms of resources that talk to each other as, as data assets, and, and the relationship between these assets, this helps us, right? Now I don't have this weird picture of apps talking to each other, but rather the things that are most important to me instead. <clears throat> so this is really the, the assertion and the challenge um, that, I, that I have for, for everybody today, is you know, go away and think about how we're planning for the future. You know, when you look at the integration strategy you have within your business today, or how you're approaching the problem of offering your product as an API to customers and partners and consumers, are you doing the right thing? Are, have you planned for the sort of scale um, that we're headed towards? Because we're, we're going there fast. There are definitely th steps that we can take right now in order to avoid a scale apocalypse and, and that is, uh, that, that's the journey I would challenge everybody to start uh, looking at. How do we avoid this apocalypse of scale? <clears throat> there is one other thing that I wanted to say. Uh, at uh, Cloud Elements, we produce a report every year ca called the State of API Integration Report. It's now in its third year uh, for 2019. 
Um, during, in, within this report, we collect a bunch of feedback from API practitioners, providers, developers, architects, product managers, et cetera. And we, we try to gather together all of the challenges and problems and issues that people have as they deal with API integration specifically. And uh, this report isn't about API design or, or um, you know, the periphery of APIs necessarily. It's very, very focused on the notion of making API integration simpler. Um, I'd just like to give a special shout out because we have contributors to this report. Uh, Mehdi, our host and founder of API Days, um, contributes to this report. He was um, part of the report in 2019. We have uh, friends like Mike Amundsen, whose co content I've uh, blatantly stolen today. Uh, so I thank him for that too. And I would encourage you to just go check it out. Um, there's a few other folks, well-known people in the industry that help, uh, help me write this report every year. And I very much appreciate them. And it, uh, I think it's a useful piece of content and uh, you can search for it quite easily. I don't have a link here, but you can search for it quite easily and find it online. I'd encourage you to, to download it and check it out. And with that, um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Uh, we have time for one question from the audience. Oh, no scratching. <laughs> thought it was a question. Yeah, one question here. Yeah, Alex. So you made a, a specific call out uh, against API gateways and having your APIs in one place. What do you suggest is the next evolution of that idea? I wouldn't say I was calling out API gateways. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of working for some of the API management vendors along the way. Uh, I don't think we're doing the wrong thing there. We still need to manage access to APIs. That's not the wrong thing to do. Uh, but what I would say is, as we think about the APIs that we design and integrate with, we should think about them in the context of the, the data that's common between them. Um, and, uh, you know, if I was to look at that as uh, the sort of the outer layer of your API integration, those should be data oriented and not application oriented, if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. So I have a quick question for you, Russ. Uh, mm. uh, so you talk about like data, actually APIs integration is just a, all about the data. With all the business logic that all companies have, you know, from their legacy, you know, systems to their current knowledge of the market, do you think we really, we really can like have the same data models for a specific industry and be able to share these, these patterns and these, and these models and really collaborate for full interoperability, right? You know, do you think we can achieve that or no, there will always be something avoiding it? You know, I would like to say yes, we can achieve it. And I think in an ideal world, um, we, we could get there. It seems, uh, like it's, it's quite a, it's a bridge quite far away from us right now. Um, but there's, there's a foundation, right? We have, uh, um, you know, things like the schema.org that Yuri mentioned on, uh, yesterday morning, right? The, um, RDF, the semantic web is not a new concept. There, there's definitely a good foundation we can lean on. Um, I think we'll probably never be in the sort of nirvana state of everything just working interoperably, operably, um, but um, if we could have a, at least a few common pieces of language, uh, a lingua franca for, for the most common pieces of data, that would go a long way. Okay, thank you, Ra. Thank you for your point. Thank you. Thank you.